It's been a few years since my last Sequitur tutorial, and I thought today would be the perfect opportunity to go back and revisit this software. If you'd like to follow along, I will have a link for this in the video description below, because he has gone through and created a new website, and also some newer versions. And today we're going to be using the 1.6 version, so if you want to follow along, I would recommend also reading the manual, because I can't cover everything in one video, and this is a good refresher on what you need to do. If you've got Sequitur installed and you're ready to follow along, I'd recommend we actually start off in Adobe Bridge. This is going to be the easiest way to go through with the workflow. Alternatively, you can use Lightroom if you're more comfortable with that, but for me, Camera Raw is the simplest option along with Adobe Bridge. In this case, we'll load up Adobe Bridge, select our photos, just by clicking the Shift key, first and last images, and then right click Open in Camera Raw. And let's talk about what we're actually doing out there on location first. When I'm out there on location, if I don't have my star tracker for whatever reason, then I'm gonna be using this workflow here. Rather than taking a single 15 or 20 second long photo, I take 10 to 20 images one after the other. The critical thing here is that the settings don't change and every image is taken immediately after the other. That way the stars don't have that much time to move between the frames, which will cause problems later on the workflow. And you can have anywhere from five to 20 images, depending on how wide your focal length is, etc. In this case, I went for the maximum of about 20. That's about as far as I want to push it. Keep in mind that the more photos you have, the cleaner your image will turn out at the end. And that's really why we're doing this workflow, is because by default, with 15 or 20 seconds, our images have a lot of grain in them, and they don't look all that good. But by stacking 10, 15, or 20 images together, we're gonna get a much cleaner and detailed final image. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's start off and get these images looking halfway decent. You can pick any photo from your stack here because they should all look almost identical. In this case, we'll go with this photo here. First, let's start by increasing the exposure, and now we can actually see the foreground in some detail. I was at some sand dunes out in the desert near uh, Kanab. Next, after we can see the sky in the foreground fairly well, why don't we fix the colors? A good way to do this is to increase the saturation all the way to 100. Now that we can actually see the colors in the photo, we can adjust the temperature and tint sliders to fix any kind of color cast. If you're not sure what to do, sometimes if you just change the white balance from as shot to auto, that does a good job. If things still look kind of weird though, you can just move the sliders around until you get the color balance that you prefer. A lot of us like that kind of purplish blue look, or if you want to go for a more natural, you can go with daylight, which looks terrible. So I'm gonna stick with the more uh, subdued colors, maybe something like that. After you've got your white balance looking fairly good, then we can lower the saturation back down from 100 to whatever you think looks reasonable. Because when we're shooting in raw at night, we don't really get a lot of color information, and that's why we generally wanna crank it up around 30 or 40 on the saturation slider. Let's jump ahead a quick second and go to the detail tab right here. By default, the Detail tab generally applies 40 sharpening. And at 40 sharpening, that's also gonna exacerbate the grain in your photo. So I'd recommend whenever you're doing Astro and you're following a workflow similar to this, make sure you go to the Detail tab and put sharpening to zero. That will save you a lot of headaches in the long run. Because we're stacking 20 photos today, we don't really need to do any noise reduction. That'll be accomplished through the stacking process. But if your photos are still really grainy, for whatever reason, you could do a minor amount of noise reduction here, maybe 10 to 15. I wouldn't go any higher than that. The higher you go, the less detail you're going to have, and ultimately that's defeating the whole purpose of today's uh, workflow. So again, I'm probably going to leave mine at zero, but if you really wanted to push it, you could probably put noise reduction to 10 or 15. Let's zoom back out. We got the detail tab taken care of. Next, let's take a look at the optics tab. Under optics, we can just click this button to use profile corrections, and hopefully your lens is automatically detected. In my case, the Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter was. However, if you're using a Samyang or a Rokinon or something else, you might have to go where it says make and choose the brand that you're using. Maybe that's Tamron, Sigma, whatever. And it should automatically find the lens that you were using if you choose the correct manufacturer. If not though, you can go to the model next and make sure it is actually pulling in the correct option. Now in my case, I'm just gonna go back to Nikon, but I wanna make sure we cover that. And while we're talking about profile corrections, notice here we have distortion and vignette. 
By default, it's gonna apply 100 distortion and 100 vignette correction, but if you leave the distortion at 100, then you might actually get really weird artifacts later on in the workflow. And plus, for a lot of us, we're never gonna notice the distortion correction anyway, so I'd highly recommend you put the distortion correction to zero, and that should prevent any problems from cropping up later on in the video. For the vignette, you can either leave that at 100 and manually apply a vignette at the end of the workflow, or you can just leave it in. Some people like that natural vignette, that's up to you. I might leave a little bit of vignette in though, and I can always add one in later. With our optics tab taken care of, we can go back to the basic tab up top, and with all of our problems kind of figured out, at this point you can make whatever adjustments you want to the photo in terms of contrast and whites and blacks and shadows and all that. In this scenario, I might bring down the highlights a little bit to preserve the nebula, although it's kind of hard not to blow those out in this scenario. But even just bringing down the highlights a little bit will preserve some detail. In addition, I could potentially increase the contrast a little bit. And all I'm really doing is just moving sliders around and seeing what looks good to me. Because maybe the foreground is a little too bright and distracting, or it's not bright enough. That's where the shadow slider really comes in handy. Whites will really accentuate the core, but it will also blow out most of the stars. So I wouldn't go too high on the whites there. Then blacks, obviously that's gonna affect the darker areas. If you're happy with the overall image, you might wanna just check it over one more time. And with all that done, why don't we sync now our settings with the rest of the photos? And this is very easy. Just come over to the left, click on your thumbnail that you're working on, and then hit Control or Command A to select all the other thumbnails. Or if that's not working, you can right click and then select all at the top. Once all of your thumbnails are selected though, you should see a little button right here with the little sliders and a circle. That's your sync settings button. You can click that if you wanna do it quickly, or you can right click sync settings. Either way, it's gonna do the same thing. When the pop-up window appears, normally it's already preset and everything's gonna be fine. So I just hit okay. And there we go. Every single photo now has the exact same edits applied. That's what we want to see. And this would be a good time to just go over each image real quick and make sure there's nothing weird. Maybe one of your photos didn't quite turn out the way that the others did. And in that case, you could mark it for deletion down here and get rid of it. But if you're happy with everything, let's go back to our thumbnails, right click, select all one more time if need be. Now we're going to save these as high quality TIFF files for our stacking. And to do that, you can either click this little download looking button right here, or you can right click on your thumbnail, save images, save images. This will allow us to save these as TIFFs. So just go through, you might even want to pause the video, just make sure everything looks the way it does here. And then the big thing is making sure the folder is set correctly. By default, it'll probably try and save it in some random folder potentially, and you'll never find it. So again, do make sure you create a new folder here. We'll call it TIFF, and then we'll save our photos inside of this TIFF folder. Verify the format is set to TIFF as well. Down here, your color space, I recommend sRGB. That should give you good results for most people. And then a color depth, everybody's gonna tell you to do 16 bits per channel. Sequitor is gonna output in 16 bits per channel. So if you wanna stay consistent, you could change this to 16 bits per channel. However, these take up a lot of space. And to be honest, I doubt 99% of you could tell the difference between eight and 16 bits anyway. So I'm gonna do eight bits today and nobody will ever know the difference. And we'll save on hard drive space as well. That'll looks good there. Again, you might wanna pause the video, but we're all set. We'll hit save and then we'll pick up when this is done. All of our photos have finished saving. We'll click done in the lower right. And now we're actually ready to move on into Sequitor. If you wanna follow along, we can open that up. And this is actually my first time using the newer version, but it looks like it's almost identical to the older versions, which is great. The way this application works, if you're completely new to it, is up top you have a couple different buttons. This is how you're gonna load your files in, specify your output. After you've got all these red lights taken care of, then you're gonna come down to this area and worry about the different settings. So let's start off with the very top red light. It says star images. If we double click on that, we can navigate to our folder where we saved our TIFFs and continue on from there. After you've found your TIFF files, you can click on the first one, hold down the shift, click on the last one, and then hit open. If you're not seeing your photos listed in the folder and you know they're there, the acceptable formats, you might wanna choose a different option if they're not being uh, selected. Okay, it's loaded in. 
all of our light frames. And it says base image is 7611. And if you kind of just glance at our list here, 7611 is right in the middle. What that really means is that it's going to try and line the sky to this particular image because the photos before it, the Milky Way might have been over here. The photos after that midpoint might have been over here, the Milky Way. So it's trying to line them all back up to a center location. That's really what it's trying to do behind the scenes. But basically all we've done so far is load in our light frames or star images. Now we need to double click on the next red light, which is output. This is how we're going to specify the file name. After we double click on output, you can just call this sequitur or whatever you want to do and then hit save. For those of you that took dark or flat frames, you can also include those by double clicking on the two buttons here and loading those in. But if you're following my workflow today, we don't really need to worry about them. All we need are the nice light frames. The first part of Sequitor is done already. We loaded in our files, specified the output. Now we just need to choose the camera settings. For this, I'd recommend you go down to Composition Align Stars. And we're going to go down to the very bottom and choose Freeze Ground. It says both sky and ground can still be stacked, but sharp. After we click on Freeze Ground, we're going to use Selective. That way you'll throw out any planes or meteors that might have come through here, which if you're shooting during a meteor shower, you might not want to do that. Either way, after we selected Freeze Ground, notice how we have a red light next to Sky Region. That means we need to do something. I'll click on Sky Region. Then we'll click Auxiliary Highlight checkbox in the lower left. What we're going to be doing is painting in a mask to create our layer mask, just like we would do in Photoshop. Thankfully, I've got a very easy horizon line here, and this is where you might run into problems. If you've got a lot of trees or bushes along the horizon, this is going to be a nightmare. And for that, I'd recommend checking out my astrophotography post-processing course. I've got hours and hours of videos in there that will teach you another way to do your stacking and make the most out of your star tracker if you have one. So if you have a lot of trees and bushes and things, this is where you're going to run into problems. And again, I'd recommend checking out my Astro Post Processing course on my website for more information. Getting back on track though, after you've clicked Auxiliary Highlight you're using a regular mask, you should see a little cursor on screen now, which you can make bigger or smaller just by scrolling with your mouse wheel if you have that functionality. And we want to paint in the sky with this brush. If I just click and drag over the sky, we can now see our mask. Everything green will be selected for the sky. Once you get most of the sky selected, we can use the scroll wheel on our mouse to make the brush smaller. Get closer to the horizon. And this is why I love living out in the desert because I don't have to worry about any trees getting in the way. It makes my life a lot easier. And there we go. In just a few seconds, I've got my layer mask and we're ready to move on. So obviously you might want to pause the video if you've got a lot more work to do. Let's say you're going through here though and you accidentally paint in a big splotch of green on your foreground. It's not a big deal. You can use the right click on your mouse to erase. So right click will erase and you want the foreground to be all red, the sky to be all green. If you can do that, you'll be in good shape. And it doesn't have to be perfect as long as it's fairly good. That looks good enough to me. If we continue down the list over on the left, we have some different options we can do. If you want to try and remove hot pixels, things like that, turn on high dynamic range. To be honest, I really don't mess with any of these things. All I care about is that the composition is set to freeze ground selective, and we are doing the align stars method, and then the sky region we've already painted it in. That's really all there is to it. If you've done that, you can hit start at the bottom, and it will go through and stack all of our photos. So I'll catch up with you guys when this is all done. And in just under two minutes, we're already complete. We can hit close. This should give us a look at the final image, which already looks noticeably cleaner. And if your computer is set up to automatically open TIFFs in Photoshop, click the blue hyperlink that says open at the top of the screen. And as soon as you do that, we should be loaded in and ready to go. If your computer is not configured properly, then you'll have to navigate to the folder listed here and manually open that TIFF in Photoshop. However you have to do it though, we can close out of Sequitor now. We'll hit yes, we don't need to save it. And if I zoom in, the stars are a little bit blurry. That's just because I chose a slightly longer shutter speed than I should have. But I mean, it's much cleaner now. And we're gonna be able to get more detail out of this photo. If we look at our foreground as well, that's noticeably cleaner than it would be in a single photo. 
This would also be a good time to scan around the horizon because that's really where you're gonna notice the most problems. And I can see a little bit of grain here just because my mask wasn't perfect, but I'm not really too worried about it. Okay, now that we've seen what the finished image looks like, let's compare that with a single TIFF photo and make sure we actually got the best results. I've just loaded in one of these single frames of TIFFs. We'll rename these so we don't get confused. On the bottom we have sequitur, on the top we have a single TIFF. Now if we zoom in, let's do a before and after comparison. Here's one photo. Pretty grainy, doesn't look the best. When we stack them all together though, it's much cleaner and that's gonna do a much nicer job for us. We should also take a look at the foreground next because that's where we're gonna notice a lot of grain for most of us. This looks pretty gnarly. You can't even hardly see any detail there in the sand. Not that there would be much to see anyway, but when we do our stack, that is almost 100 times better for sure. We still have a few hot pixels and things, which those would be very easy to fix with the spot healing brush just by clicking on the image. And in a few seconds, all of those are gone, so I'm not worried about those. But yeah, that looks great. Again, a single photo just looks hideous, especially in the foreground. And then after stacking, it looks a thousand times better. And if you like the results from this, this is just one more reason why I consider getting a Star Trek if you don't have one already. Because that opens up a whole new world of possibilities where you're just going to take usually one or two photos for the foreground, one or two for the sky, and you're going to get much higher quality results than you can even get with this workflow in Sequitur. And that's why I've got so many videos dedicated to Star Trackers here on my YouTube page and over on my website. But that's how you're going to use Sequitur to create a clean, detailed photo without the help of any Star Trackers. Just to recap, when you're out there on location, take, I would say, 10 to 20 photos, one after the other. Then just go through and follow what we did in the video. It's that easy. From here, though, because we haven't done a Photoshop tutorial in a while, let's just go through and I'll show you what I would do. By default, I think it looks really nice. It's kind of boring though. I mean, there's just some sand in the Milky Way. I've seen that a million times personally. So if we want to, we could add maybe a curves layer. And when we add a curves layer, there's this handy feature where we have the hand tool. And with the hand tool, we can specify areas we want to make brighter or darker. For example, I can click right here with my mouse and drag it upwards to make that brighter. And then find an area I want to make darker, click and drag down. Now in this case, that might've gone a little bit too heavy on that. And if we look over at our graph, it definitely did not put the points where I wanted it to necessarily. So if you want, you can always grab the points manually on your graph and move them around. And that should also help you out. I still think the effect is a little too strong. And that's why for every single layer and curve and all that, we have an opacity slider right here. It's normally at 100%. But if I like the effect and think it's a little too strong, I'll just lower the amount to maybe 20 or 30 that will give me just a slight increase on the contrast. Next, I'll go to my Raya Pro. This is from Jimmy McIntyre. And if you haven't heard of it before, I'd highly recommend checking it out. And that's Raya Pro. But in one of his older versions that I still have on here, he has this thing called Big Vignette, which is awesome. I just click Big Vignette. And now we have some naturally darkened corners, which draws your eye to the Milky Way. Just like before, if I think it's too strong though, I'll lower the opacity from 100% to maybe just 30 or 40 percent. Now it's much more subdued and it draws our eye towards the Milky Way right there. If you're not a fan of your current color balance, then we can go to the color balance tool right here. It has some little scales and the color balance tool allows you to affect the shadows, midtones, or highlights, or all three. I normally start off in midtones and then I can move the sliders left and right. And you don't have to go very far here at all. Usually plus or minus five is plenty. And this will really affect the mood of the photo. If you get the color balance looking good for the midtones, then you can change it to maybe highlights or shadows next and continue to make some small tweaks. This is just one way to alter the colors in your photo. And it's fairly easy to do just by moving these sliders. And you can see it was originally a little bit greener, you know, more green than I'd like. Now we've subdued that to some extent. I think it looks fairly good. Maybe I'll lower the opacity though to 70%. If we go back to our adjustments tab, I can continue to add different adjustments to further alter the colors. For example, we have the selective color tool. This is one I use in almost every uh, image. And when our selective color tool loads up, we can choose reds, yellows, greens, blues, etc. 
Right now, most of our reds are located in the sand dunes. They are called coral pink for a reason. And by moving the sliders around, I can really accentuate the reds there or tone them down if they're a little bit too strong. Then I can alter the color of the red to make it more yellow or more magenta. You get the idea. From there, I can move down to maybe greens or blues. In this case, I'll go with cyans. And this is really gonna target the sky there. So I can remove some of that blue color if I think it's a little too strong, or I can adjust the overall color balance just by, again, moving some sliders around. And if you wanna learn more about how to use these tools, again, I'd recommend my Astro Post Processing course. We go into all these tools in a lot of detail. We go through multiple different images. I give you some practice photos that you can actually follow along with. And that's one of the best ways to get more comfortable using Photoshop and ultimately get better images. Finally, there's neutrals, whites and blacks here, which is very similar to the color balance tool we just used. If I go to the neutrals, see how much of an effect that's having on the image. And this would be a very useful tool to altering the colors in your photo. Again, we're under the neutrals in selective color. I could spend another hour here on this image, but I think we're just about done for today. I wanna to show you one other cool thing with Raya Pro before we go. Under the FF button for Raya Pro, we did big vignette before, there's also a magic green lens. And if you click on this, it's gonna go through and apply a bunch of different effects to the image all at once. Now, when it finishes, it's gonna look pretty gnarly, but that's okay, because we can go in and selectively turn on and off and reduce some of the effects that we don't want. There is the final version. See how it added a nice soft glow to the photo and also drew your eye naturally here to the center of the frame. I think that looks great. But if it's a little too strong, we'll open up the Magic Green Landscapes folder here and then go through these one by one by turning on and off the eyeballs. If you find something you don't like, in this case, the levels adjustments a little too much, I'll lower the opacity to maybe 60%. Then we'll go down to the vignette. I think the vignette's fine, but it's also a little too strong. We have a color balance layer, which I don't know how much of a fan of that one I am. I might put that at about 30%. We have a soft glow type look, which as you can see, I'm pretty much just turning everything down because I think everything was just a little bit stronger than I would prefer. And this is why I love the Magic Green Lands in Raya Pro because you just have so much flexibility and it really does make things a lot easier. There we go. Now that we've edited every individual portion of the Magic Green Landscapes, we can turn it on and off one more time. And then we can even do a global adjustment for this whole thing and say, maybe I only want it to be 80%. And there we go. I think we'll call that a finished image. We'll file save. And if you're ready, you can say this is a JPEG as well. But I hope you enjoyed the video today. I think we covered a lot of really good points. And the big thing was just to show you that Secretor is still just as easy to use as ever. You just click a few buttons, load in your photos, and that's going to allow you to get a much cleaner and detailed photo without the need for a star tracker. If you have any more questions, you can leave a comment or I'd recommend going over to my website. And again, checking out some of the courses on there, which go into a lot more detail on the whole process of astrophotography.